Thank you. Welcome to this meeting of Baber Planning Committee. I will now ask the government officer to read out the domestic arrangements and the fire regulations. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Chair. Please ensure that you maintain social distancing from all other persons whilst in the chamber and the communal areas. Please ensure that you wear face covering at all times unless you are sitting down or if you are exempt from doing so and that you use the hand sanitizer and wipes provided. Please do not interrupt other speakers or hold separate conversations whilst others are speaking. If you are attending the meeting to speak and persistently interrupt the meeting, you may be asked to leave. Please ensure your mobile phones are on silent or switched off and that your laptop is also switched to silent. We will be using the e-voting for this meeting on the Modern Gov app, so please could members make sure they are logged in and ready to use the app. If you hear the fire alarm, leave the building immediately via a fire exit and make your way to the assembly point, which is Ipswich Town Football Ground. Follow the signs directing you to the fire exit at each end of the floor. Do not enter the atrium. If you are in the atrium at the time of the alarm, follow the signs to the nearest fire exit. Use the stairs, not the lifts, and do not re-enter the building until it is safe to do so. The council, members of the public and the press may record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Claire. Introductions. With us today are the Chief Planning Officer, Phil Isbell, Area Planning Ma Manager, Mark Russell, Legal Advisor, Ian Dupre. We have Case Officers, Rose Walton and Samantha Summers and Joe Hobbs. The Governance Officer is Claire Philpott. Can I move to the agenda, please? Apologies for absence and substitutes. Thank you, Chair. We have apologies from Councillor Margaret Maybury and Councillor Simon Barrett is substituting. Councillor David Busby and Councillor Bryn Hurran is substituting. And we also have apologies from Councillor Peter Beer. Thank you. Receive declarations of pecuniary and non-pecuniary interests by members. Are there any to declare? No, thank you. Confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of February. Are there any points regarding the accuracy of these minutes? Councillor McCraw. Um, para 118.17 suggests provision, provision of defibrillators. I'd suggest that should be the singular, not multiples. Yeah, we can amend that. Thank you. Anything else? No? Can I have a proposal, please? Thank you, Councillor Ayres. Seconder, Councillor Osborne. Government officer will now conduct the electronic vote. Chair, I would just amend that to reflect that small change. Thank you. That vote is now in progress, members. Councillor Hurran, can I take your vote? Uh, no, okay, yep, great, thank you. <coughs> Councillor Barrett? Uh, yeah. The same? Thank you, Chair. That's seven votes for and three abstentions. Thank you. Mr. the meeting has been confirmed and will be signed. Claire amends my copy. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Moving on. To receive notification petitions in accordance with the Council's petition scheme. None received, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Site inspections. Chair, we have two site inspection requests and Joe Hobbs is going to present both of them to us. Thank you. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. OK, 
Okay, we have um, two cyber visit requests. Um, the first cyber visit request is for two applications, um, and they are overlapping in nature, and so we're presenting these two applications to you in one site visit request. Um, they are for two applications that are currently ongoing at Bellevue Park in Sudbury. Just uh, going to quickly run through the location and the nature of the proposals. So the first application is relating to the park entrance, demolition of the wall um, and uh, rebuilding of new park entrance. Um, here's the proposals just shown in graphic form. And the second application is for the uh, construction of 42 retirement living apartments and the conversion and restoration of um, Bellevue House following partial demolition. And just to run through the proposals, here we have the new proposed flats to the uh, left-hand side of the top site um, elevation there and Bellevue House to the right. And just showing the other aspects on the bottom of the slide and the western elevation. And just to run through some quick photos of Bellevue Park running around the site and just seeing it from a distance um, and so um, officers um, have uh, received requests from members and are recommending that uh, planning committee undertake site inspections uh, for the two applications given that they have um, an overlapping nature and so you can have regard to the local circumstances it would be important for members to take into account when the applications come to committee thank you chair thank you joe are there any questions Councillor Owen first, you were first. Thank you. Just gonna, is that to do with the crossing as well? Because you didn't mention the crossing. Um, I am not um, certain if that is part of the planning application. Um, apologies. Um, if it is part of the planning applications, then yes, it would be to do with the crossings as well. Okay, yes. and can I, can I request that we do have the, um, obviously, county highways there as well, please? Um, we can certainly ask that question of them, yes. Thank you. Councillor Ayres, you want to ask? Your question. Councillor Osborne, did you want to ask? Yes, thank you, um, Mr Chairman. Uh, not really a question, it's just um, I perhaps think that it's a good idea to have the, although the um, uh, information provided by the officer I think is, is good, uh, will be good, but I think it's a sound, uh, a sound thing to have a, a site visit to it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harin. Thank you, Chair. Is it possible for substitutes to attend this meeting as well, please? I see no reason why not. Well, I think as a, as a matter of practical common sense, the. As far as possible, the councillors who are going to be determining the application would go on the site visit. I'm looking at my governance colleague, and, 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 and that would be your expectation, Mrs. Hobbs, I, I dare say. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. I think the answer to your question is yes. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Owen, you. Going on for that one, can I request that um, some of the Sudbury Town councillors get invited as well, please? What's, what's, what's our usual practice, Mrs. Philpott? I'm not sure, to be honest. Usually, if it's in their parish or town, they would be invited, but they would just be there to observe. Councillor McCraw. I just wondered if we had any indication as to when the site visit might be proposed. At the moment, next week, next Wednesday. It's free at the moment. Are we. Can I have a proposer and a seconder? Thank you. Can I have a show of hands for all those in favour? Have you got a vote on yeah, yeah. Oh, hang on, I'm told there's a vote, doesn't there? There is an electronic vote ready for us. Yes, thank you, Chair. There is an um, electronic vote ready. That's now in progress. Thank you. Thank you, members. Chair, that is 10 votes for. 
So we will next Wednesday. We hope. Yeah. Is that okay, Jim? Um, yes, yes, and we have a second site visit that um, is also in close vicinity that we're just about to present as well. So um, we'll just uh, discuss the perhaps timings after the next vote. So you have one more. Thank you. Would you like to go ahead with that one? Thank you. Um, this is the second site visit request um, we have received. This planning application is um, on Churchfield Road uh, in Chilton, outside Sudbury. And the application is an, out an application for 166 dwellings and 60 bed care home along with um, open space and um, related infrastructure. Just to quickly run through the site, the application site in Sudbury, Chilton Industrial Estate, and Chilton Woods Development, just for um, context. And here's the site in particular. You can see Sudbury Community Health Centre, just to the um, corner of the site there. And just to quickly show um, the site in relation to the existing constraints, we've got the existing settlement boundary, built up area boundary there. And the site is on land identified for employment under the current local plan, as shown in pink there. Just to point out, um, the site does have some constraints around it. I think the key constraints are the listed buildings. We have the Grade 1 uh, St Mary's Church, the blue rectangle there, and we have Grade 2 Chilton Hall, Grade 2 Chilton Hall Garden Wall, and Grade 2 um, Historic Park and Garden, just showing the extent there. Just to quickly run through the proposals, um, the application is for outline only with access applied for. The red circles show the location of the two accesses proposed, and there's also um, blue circles showing the pedestrian accesses uh, proposed around the site, creating footpaths. And here's the parameter plan that accompanies the outline application, just showing the accesses, the care home location, and the residential shown in brown there and as shown the open space quality mitigation area shown in green. Just quick to show some photos for context, we've got the existing um, Sudbury Health Centre there and proposed existing access to that health centre will be the, one of the access points into the site. You just see the photo location shown in yellow on the bottom left of the slide. Just rolling around the site there, looking to the north towards Chilton Hall and looking down Churchfield Road. This is on Great Wardingfield Road, residential dwellings uh, just to the uh, west of the health centre and looking up Great Wardingfield Road, the B1115. And just looking across the site towards Chilton Hall there, although it's behind the trees and uh, vegetation line. Just looking around the site. And if you just see um, in the distance there, you can see the church, St Mary's Church. And lastly, just to show you the um, relationship to the, res uh, the employment area, or well, the existing employment buildings in the employment area. Uh, the location of that silver car is the second access point I showed earlier with the red circle. I'm just showing the site to the right of that slide and just looking um, in the site back towards the employment units to the south side of Churchfield Road. Uh, so uh, we have received requests for um, site visit from members and um, officers recommend that uh, given the site constraints, um, in the surrounding area that uh, members undertake a site visit prior to determining the planning application at a future planning committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Joe. Any questions? Councillor Barrett. Um, as this is employment land, um, I take it this has been marketed and EN24 has been applied to this site? Um, that will be a matter that will be presented in the committee reports uh, when the application is brought to planning committee and discussed at that point. Well, I think it's quite relevant that we know if we go on a site visit to look at the employment land site, which is obviously going for residential, um, I think it would be quite nice if we're going to look at that site that we know what the basis of the decision is likely to be. Uh, because that, um, we know what a site looks like. It's an employment site. What we've got to determine is whether that employment site, um, the benefit to the public of t overturning our own policy is there. So I think we need to be um, a little bit more informed of what has gone on, because if there has been no marketing plan, then really this shouldn't really be coming to, to, to us for an, a decision, because we have a policy which is quite clear on that. 
Um, yes, we can certainly um, advise uh, members at the site visit of any points of clarification they wish to see, but my understanding, the, the question today is, um, would members like to um, have a site visit on this planning application? Um, and obviously, those matters will be um, considered in more detail once officers have uh, completed the uh, committee report for the application. Thank you, Joe. I think, can I ask the Chief Planning Officer to just chip in at this point? Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, just, just for clarity, the site visit has very defined function within the Constitution. The marketing policy that you describe and the marketing exercise <coughs> is a matter of the uh, merits or demerits, as you, as you may find them. Uh, from our perspective as officers, they will be reported, that, that issue will be reported in the report that you, is presented to committee. The site visit is there to look at facts. That is not, from my point of view, a fact that will be discernible or relevant to uh, a site inspection, looking at the characteristics of the land, its relationship to the surrounding areas. Uh, and the question of merit, obviously, is something that will uh, arrive when the committee report is presented to members. And applications come to committee all the time with policies which are, to a degree or otherwise, complied with or not complied with, and the committee then judges them. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Phil. Any other questions? Councillor Owen, you were waiting. It's really an invitation one again. Can we make sure that Lady Hart gets an invitation, please, because she's Chair of Chiltern Parish. Thank you. I believe the whole Parish Council will be invited. Councillor McLaren. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I just... I, I shall be on on your leave, actually. Do I have to send a substitute to the site inspection? Not absolutely necessary, but, okay, but if, you, you. if you know who it is, you couldn't invite them to come. Yeah, but I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Yes. Councillor Ayers. Because I'm subbing for, um, Councillor, for, um, for the health scrutiny, so therefore I will not be able to be there, but as I live there, I know it very well. But I give my apologies now because I'll be somewhere else. We, we haven't agreed yet, Councillor Ayers, so that's... <laughs> Any more questions to the other? Councillor Osborne. Thank you, thank you, Mr Chairman. I, I must add that the presentation in the local plan from Sudbury Town Council was that be kept as employment land. And uh, my concern is, as uh, Councillor uh, Barrett has already <coughs> said, is that that will be taken away and we will lose valuable um, employment land. Thank you. Thank you. Mr State. Councillor Hinton. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Can I just ask, what are the actual reasons for the site visit, rather than just members have asked for it? We usually have planning reasons why people are asking for a site visit. Thank you, Chair. I can answer that question. Um, the, due to the constraints surrounding the site, the proximity um, to the listed buildings and the employment area designation are the key reasons that members have listed in the request for site visits. Um, it's a well, a practical question. Again, this is all about arranging substitutes. Um, do I understand that these applications that we have just agreed one for and are about to agree the, agree the other for, taking place on the 6th, would be determined on the following meeting on the 13th? Not necessarily. Or is that an assumption I'm that's incorrectly correct. making? It would, affect, it would affect if I needed to get a substitute for the site visit or um, what, what, what basically I do. The answer to that, I think, is no. To keep the answer simple. Can I have a proposer then, if we have a site visit? Councillor Owen, seconder. Councillor Jameson, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Members, that vote is now in progress. Councillor Horan. Councillor Barrett. Thank you. One for, one against. Thank you, members, Chair. That's eight votes for and two votes against. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. 
Thank you very much. Moving on to the schedule of planning applications. Um, give the officers time to swap over. Okay, moving on to planning applications. We have DC 2104360, Shawn Golf Club, Hintlesham. I will now invite the case officer to introduce the application to the committee. <coughs> uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. This application is a hybrid uh, at Hintlesham Golf Club comprising a full application for the erection of a greenkeeper's building following the demolition of the existing and an outline application for the erection of five dwellings. The village of Hintlesham is identified as a hinterland village within the Babercore strategy and therefore accommodates some development to help meet the needs within its functional cluster. Development, however, is only permitted within the settlement boundary unless a proven and justified need is demonstrated. This presentation is designed to provide illustration only and must be considered in conjunction with the associated committee report, which you should all have had access to. Moving into the main planning issues. Uh, these include the principle of development in its location enabling development and the impact to the heritage assets. Uh, this is the site with its access. This is Hintlesham Golf Club and this is Hintlesham Hall, which is part grade one and part grade two star listed and the golf course spans over to the east. For wider context, this is the site with the village of Hintlesham to the south. The village has some services and community facilities, which include a community hall, St. Nicholas Church, a pub, primary school, and farm shop. This is the settlement boundary of Hintlesham in the current Baber local plan. The site is not located within this settlement boundary. This plan shows the location of the site compared to the settlement boundary, the access abuts the boundary to the south, which is shown in orange. In terms of constraints, the area in pink is the site. To the south is the grade one Hintlesham Hall and its grade two star listed stables, former coach house and brew house. Historic England also identify the area as being historic parkland to Hintlesham Hall and an undesignated heritage asset. The site and surrounding land is also located within a special landscape area. And the green dotted line also shows a public footpath that runs past the site and Hintlesham Hall. Uh, to the south, where the access starts, there are two grade two listed buildings, as well as a protected woodland and various protected trees. Moving on to the proposal. As mentioned before, the hybrid application forms two parts. Full application for the erection of a greenkeeper's building 
as well as outline permission for five dwellings. The sale of the land with the five dwellings is proposed to finance the erection of the Greenkeepers building, amongst other things, um, which will be discussed shortly. This plan shows the proposed layout for the Greenkeepers building, as well as the area of land proposed for the five dwellings. This is the proposed floor plan of the Greenkeepers building, providing storage for the golf club, as well as a workshop area. This is the front elevation, which would face west towards the site for the five dwellings. This is the rear elevation, which would face east. This is the south elevation. And this is the north elevation. And this is the north elevation again with additional planting. The five dwellings are proposed to be located to the west of the Greenkeepers building. As this is outlined, there are no confirmed details of the scheme, only the number of dwellings proposed. A tree nursery zone to the north has also been proposed, as well as planting to the east and the retaining of the hedge to the west. This is an illustrative example of a layout and sizes of the dwellings on the site and an example of how it might look with the Greenkeepers building in the background. This is only illustrative. As this is outlined only, no confirmed details of the dwellings are proposed at this stage. This is the site as it currently stands with the existing Greenkeepers building, the owner of the golf club's house and the golf club, and the car park to the south. This is an example of what the site may look like with the dwellings and with the Greenkeepers building. This is a more zoomed out shot of the site as it exists. And this is an example of what the site may look like with the Greenkeepers building and then with the dwellings. These are the proposed site levels. It is proposed that the dwellings would be no higher than that of the existing tree line to the west and the existing buildings. This is another plan showing the proposed levels compared to existing buildings and additional proposed buildings serving Hindlesham Hall, which will be discussed shortly. It should be noted that although the dwellings would be lower in height than the tree line and the existing buildings, there still would be a viewpoint into the site and the roofs of the dwellings may still be viewed from the south looking north um, where there is no tree line. There is, however, a wall which we saw on site. Moving on to access. The Greenkeepers building would utilize the existing access and would have a small area of new access adjacent to the building. The existing accesses are here and here, and the new access would be here. The proposed five dwellings is an outline application only, and therefore the access to the dwellings is not confirmed at this stage. Access onto the site, however, will need to be introduced, and in earlier plans, an access was shown here. This is, however, not confirmed at this stage. The application offers a pedestrian footway at the uh, access from Hintlesham, uh, which the golf club have a right of access to. There is an existing footpath on the south side of the road, and this new footway would have a dropped curb to allow people to cross. No formal crossing is proposed, however. Uh, county highways are in agreement of this footway. Uh, for reference, here is the site and here is where the footway would be. The application proposes benefits um, for the community and for the golf club to assist in its business. The proposed benefits that may benefit the community include the pedestrian footway, which we just discussed. Uh, this would allow for crossing from the access to the existing footway, although no formal crossing is proposed as well as tree planting in the form of a tree nursery zone. This tree planting is proposed to assist Baber in achieving its tree planting plan 
as well as providing a nursery for tree transplanting and to provide screening. The proposed benefits for the golf club include the replacement of the greenkeeper's building, which would allow the golf club to store their golf buggies more securely and to provide a safer building. The replacement and renewal of outdated and broken machinery, which would allow the golf club to maintain the course and attract new members as well as the replacement of the drainage and irrigation system and extend it, which would serve the golf course and stop it from deteriorating. The sale of the land with the five dwellings is proposed to finance these items listed. Without the monies from the sale of the land with the five dwellings, the golf club have described a situation where they will not be able to finance the replacement of the greenkeeper's building outdated and broken equipment and irrigation system which is needed to run the golf club business. This plan shows the ownership of the land surrounding the golf club. The black outlined area shows the site of this application, the golf club and the car park, which is all in the ownership of the applicant. The red outlined area shows the golf course, which the golf club owners lease, and they have a 99 year lease, although it is unclear how long is left on that lease at this stage. The blue outlined area shows where the proposed tree nursery would be located, which is leased. It is unclear at this stage how long that lease is on this piece of land. You can see that the entrance drive and the area of land proposed for the footway is outside of the ownership or leased land of the golf club. However, they do have a right of access over it. Moving on to the heritage harm. Historic England and Place Services Heritage share the assessment that the development of the five houses would cause a moderate level of less than substantial harm to the designated heritage assets. Being the Grade 1 listed hall and Grade 2 star listed stables, former coach house and brew house, and the undesignated heritage asset of the Hintersham Parkland. The open views across the parkland with minimal built development is important to the understanding of the hall and stables as a country house within a large landscape park context. It is considered that although there has already been some erosion in character of the parkland through previous permissions, the legibility of association between the hall, stables, walled garden and parkland behind is still apparent. The heritage bodies consider that the dwellings would erode this and alter the hierarchy of uses on this site. Historic England and the heritage team have made an assessment that the development of the five dwellings would cause less than substantial harm to the heritage assets. The impact to heritage assets is assessed on whether it causes harm or no harm. Harm is split into less than substantial and substantial. The heritage bodies have identified less than substantial harm in this case. Less than substantial harm is split into three levels, low, moderate, high. In this case, a moderate level of less than substantial harm has been identified, which puts the level of harm here. The MPPF states that when considering the impact of a proposed development on the significance of a designated heritage asset, great weight should be given to the asset's conservation. In this case, a moderate level of less than substantial harm has been identified and therefore paragraph 202 requires the harm to be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal. The proposed benefits of the development were discussed in the previous slides. The site is the area in pink and to the south is the grade one listed Hintlesham Hall and it's grade two star listed stables and former coach house and brew house. The land surrounding the site is also identified by Historic England as historic parkland and an undesignated heritage asset. The solid blue line is a public footpath that runs directly past the site and the hall. This is an OS map from between 1851 and 1952, which shows the area surrounding the site and the hall at St. Ocean Park, which is considered to be historic parkland and an undesignated heritage asset. It is acknowledged that a large portion of this parkland is now agricultural land. The site is highlighted, oh, sorry, is highlighted by the red 
star, and the hole, grade one listed hole, is identified by the green star. Both the Heritage Team and Historic England have identified less than substantial harm, moderate in scale, from the development of the five dwellings. It is acknowledged that change has happened in this area, however, the layout and historic features are legible. A plan has been provided showing the site for the dwellings with the historic buildings on the site overlaid. The areas in dark grey show the previous buildings on the site. These would have been small scale service and ancillary structures accessed from the service road. The previous structures are not considered to set a precedent for dwellings in this location. This is a photo of Hintlesham Hall, which is grade one listed. The site subject of this application is considered to contribute to the setting and significance of this listed hall and its grade two star listed stables, coach house and brew house. This is a photo from the service road adjacent to the hall, which offers views towards the site. The green roofed building is the existing greenkeeper's building and the yellow house is the owner of the golf club's house. From this viewpoint, it is possible that any future dwellings on the site could be seen if they were any higher than the existing wall. Place Services, Heritage and Historic England consider the development of five dwellings in this location to cause urbanisation of this area and introducing an incongruous land use in the setting of the heritage assets, detracting from the manner in which they are experienced. The dwellings would also bring with it other domestic paraphernalia, um, which could include sheds, trampolines, etc., which could further urbanise the area and cause harm to the setting of the Grade 1 listed building. This map shows where the photo was taken in relation to the heritage assets and shows what direction the camera was pointing. For reference to the historic significance of the hall and its setting, these are two Thomas Gainsborough paintings which feature the grounds of Hindlesham Hall. We don't know the exact locations of these paintings on the grounds. At the committee site visit on the 23rd of March, I was asked to provide details of planning permissions which have been granted for Hintlesham Hall. I will now run through some of these and explain why um, they were approved. In 2021, permission was granted at Hintlesham Hall for the erection of building and courtyard development west of the stables and coach house to provide additional spa facilities, gym, pool, sauna, steam room, following the removal of an outbuilding. The area in blue shows the land in the ownership of Hintlesham Hall and the area in red shows the location of the development, which is adjacent to the grade two star listed part of Hintlesham Hall. Uh, you can see the golf club to the north along with the site subject of this application. This is the um, approved block plan. Uh, the dark grey area being the new element. This is the approved north facing elevation. East facing elevation. South facing elevation. And west facing elevation. This development was approved following extensive engagement with the heritage team and historic England. <laughs> The new structures were supported as they are concentrated within an existing cluster of structures of an area of the stables, which have formerly been occupied by buildings. Although the new buildings take a different form, the courtyard element is a traditional design and the scale of the buildings are smaller than that of the existing historic buildings. The development also supports the hall's hotel business by allowing them to offer more facilities which goes hand in hand in securing the future viability of the hotel and thereby securing the repair and maintenance of the significant and important historic building. In 2019, permission was granted at Hindusham Hall for the erection of a single story function room, which would be ancillary to the hotel. This plan shows the approved block plan with the function room on the right hand side of the drawing. This is the southwest elevation northeast elevation 
southeast elevation and northwest elevation. This application was granted following engagement with the heritage team in historic England. A moderate level of less than substantial harm was identified. However, with amendments to the design and materials, both Heritage and Historic England removed their objections. In 2017, permission was granted at Homewood, which is in the same ownership of the land of the golf course and surrounding agricultural land, for the change of use of land for the erection of four safari tent holiday type units with associated parking and landscaping. This plan shows the site location in red and the blue line shows the land in the same ownership. This plan shows the design and locations of the holiday lodges. This application was granted following extensive pre-application advice with Heritage, as well as continued engagement throughout the application process. As a result of an objection from Heritage and Historic England, the number of units was reduced from eight to four, and as the units would be set down into the bowl of home wood within a heavily wooded area, it was not considered to cause any adverse harm to the setting of the listed buildings or the historic parkland. The holiday units also offer benefits for tourism in a rural location, therefore supporting the rural economy. In 2016, permission was granted at Hintersham Hall for the erection of a two-storey building to form eight bedroom suites adjacent to the Orangery building. The plan shows the approved location and you can see the site subject of this application to the north and Hintersham Hall to the south. It should be noted that this development has not been completed. This shows the approved block plan which connects eight more bedroom suites to an existing building that provides bedrooms for the hotel business. This is the approved southeast elevation. You can see it is slightly set into the land. Northwest elevation. Southwest elevation. Northeast elevation. This application was granted because the development was considered to be in keeping with the other new additions and further extends the accommodation and functionality of the hall without harming its historic fabric. Although the development was identified to cause less than substantial harm, it was outweighed by the benefit of providing an increased income to support the business and supplement the running of the grade one listed hall, thus providing viability and maintenance of the significant and important listed buildings. Although the application for the golf club would provide financial support for the business, it would not secure the maintenance and viability of a grade one listed building like some of these applications have and the public benefits are not considered to outweigh the moderate level of less than substantial harm on this basis. I will now go through some photos of the site and its surroundings. Um, however, the majority of you will have seen the site when we visited on the 23rd. This is a photo of the entrance road. Again, this is the entrance road looking towards the hall. It's largely screened by trees from this viewpoint, and you can see agricultural land on the left-hand side. This is a photo of the grade one listed hall. This is a wider view of the hall. You can see it's car park in front of the grade two star listed elements. This is another photo of the hall looking towards the car park, and it's grade two star listed buildings. This is the photo from the entrance road adjacent to the car park looking towards the site. The green roofed building is the existing greenkeepers building and the yellow house is the owner of the golf club's house. This is a photo looking towards the site from the entrance to the golf club car park. There is a small opening which at the moment allows views into the site as well as above the wall where there is no tree line. This is a photo of the Greenkeepers building and the site for the five dwellings. You can see the existing house in the background and the wall. And this is a wider view of the site for the dwellings with the existing Greenkeepers building. You can see the wall at the back um, where there isn't a tree line. And the recommendation is refusal. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Rose. Do you have any questions from members for the officer? Councillor McGraw. Thanks, Rose. Quite a long presentation, that one. Um, really glad we had a site visit. I think it was pretty essential for this, the complexities of this site. So, regarding the outstanding existing permissions, can I ask how determination was made on those uh, decisions? They were delegated decisions. Uh, to my knowledge, they didn't go to committee. Um, so there are a cumulative effect of five applications I can count there. And as far as I can see, they all lie between the site and the uh, listed heritage assets. Um, would that be correct? In yes. a line of sight, basically one end to the other. Yes. They all lie closer to the heritage assets. Yes, that's right. They are all very close to the heritage assets. Councillor James, can you be next? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the driveway that goes from the main road up to um, Hintlesham Hall and to the golf course, you say the golf course have got access rights on that. Who owns that driveway and could those rights, do we know if those rights could be rescinded? I believe um, the owner is Hintlesham Hall of that access way um, and the, the golf club does have a right of access over that. I'm not sure if they could revoke that access. Councillor Barrett. Uh, can we have a look at slide 48 again, please? Either 30, 48 or 36 would do. That's the one, that will do. So, um, we're told here that there's obviously um, a problem with the view. The only thing I can see is a great big pylon. The other thing that I'm concerned about is that would obviously then, the, with what's coming through, we're gonna get another pylon on the same size, which I think is considerably more damaging to the um, position of the grade one listed building rather than the height of a possible five properties um, so presumably we would get another pile on if we're looking at it like that uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure where the additional pile on would go in the twinstead but application. Certainly it's within that area because it's yeah. we've seen we've already seen that yeah um, so it would run along uh, past behind so the how, site. how does that square with you then um, with the I mean that could be substantial harm as opposed to more I mean, where do we st sit on that one? Because I, I just, if we're worried about the height of the buildings, my concern is more the fact we, we, we've got a great big pylon coming through. I'll get the uh, Chief Planning Officer to answer that. I mean, it's not totally relevant, but I think it's worth pointing out. Um, Chairman, I think I'd always encourage a committee to decide the application in front of them, not something else, and that's what I'd advise here and now. Um, you're not looking at an application that relates to other works. Um, you've got an application which is an outline application, and I think from what I've seen of the indicative plans there, um, sorry, um, single uh, and one and a half story dwellings together with the uh, yeah. functional building. So I'm not sure the point about heritage harm is solely about height and as to pylons and other developments, I, I would decide this application on its merits and not try to dice, decide others, Chairman. Thank you. I, I thank you for the Chief Mayor for keeping me back in line, which is exactly where I need to be. But I just point out that when we're talking about heights, which was actually commented on in Rose's presentation, uh, I think that just demonstrates what we're talking about in terms of height. Thank you. Any more questions to the author? Anthony McLaren. Thank you, Chair. Rose, you were at great pains to mention at each development that was in Hintersham Hall that it was done in conjunction or in discussion with Heritage. Were the current applicants actually advised to have some discussion with Heritage before they submitted their plans? Thank you. 
Uh, so pre-application was undertaken for this. Um, in the pre-application, Heritage were not consulted, um, but it was advised to speak specialist heritage advice given the, the proximity to the, the hall. Okay, thank you, Chair. Councillor Aaron. Thank you, Chairman. Um, one of the proposed benefits is the site for a tree nursery, 100,000 trees. Do we know who or how that will be run? Uh, the land in which the tree nursery is proposed uh, is leased by the owners of the golf club. Uh, I'm, we don't have any details of how that would be run or managed at this stage. Mr. Barton, another question. Yeah, can, I mean, I might have missed it in the report, but how do we differentiate the harm from the five outline permission as opposed to the harm or no harm for the greenkeepers workshop? How's the differentiation? Is that because it's a business? Uh, so the, the heritage bodies, uh, Place Services Heritage and Historic England, assessed the uh, no harm for the Greenkeepers building on the basis that it would um, largely follow the design of what is already there and would be pushed further back behind um, trees. So there would be um, no harm on that basis. Any other questions? No? In that case, thank you very much, Rose. And we'll move on. Public speakers. I understand that we have an objector. Is that correct, Rana? And it's Mr. Ben Borthwick. You have three minutes to address the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, members. I'm Ben Borthwick of Smith Jenkins Town Planning Consultants, acting on behalf of our client, the Hindlesham Hall Hotel. Our client operates this four-star Two Rosettes Hotel immediately adjacent to the application site. Our client objects to the application and fully supports your officer's recommendation to refuse planning permission, the reasons set out in the report. I have circulated a letter to members by email, which reiterates the comments set out on our written objection submitted to the Council back in September 2021. This letter also provides additional comments in respect of the officer's committee report. In the interest of brevity, I will not attempt to repeat all these points made in our letter. However, I would like to emphasise a number of points. The application site is located outside the built-up boundary of Hindlesham Village and is therefore within countryside, wherein local plan policy CS2 allows development only in exceptional circumstances. It is clear that the enabling development case promoted by the applicant, whereby the sale of land for the dwellings will fund maintenance and improvements of the golf club, is markedly different from the case that supported new residential development at Felixstowe Ferry Golf Club, which is mentioned in the officer report. Here, the proposal included very significant public benefits, including an increase in local jobs and other tangible benefits to the local economy, as well as attracting increased membership through the creation of a new putting green and other facilities. This is not the case with the application before you. The Felix Stowe proposal was also considered to be sustainable development because it represented a partial reuse of previously developed land adjacent to the built-up built -up area of a large town. This is in stark contrast to the proposed housing at Hindlesham Golf Club, which apart from the dwelling proposed at plot number five, would be located on undeveloped land within the countryside. The applicant has failed to provide any assessment of local housing need to justify the proposed five houses on land outside a defined settlement boundary in the context that Blaby District Council is able to demonstrate when in excess of five years of housing land supply. This is contrary to NPPF paragraph 78, which supports housing development in rural areas that reflects local needs. The statutory consultee response from English, sorry, from historic England raises strong concerns to the residential element of the proposals on heritage grounds. Historic England considers that the application does not accord with paragraph 199 or with paragraph 200 of the MPPF. Furthermore, Place Services Heritage advises that the proposal also fails to comply with the requirements of MPPF paragraph 206. To conclude, I would urge members to refuse plan permission on the basis of our client's significant concerns, which fully support your officer's recommendation in the report. Thank you. 
Are there any questions? Councillor Barry. Uh, yes, you said your client's concerns. Uh, is it that their building or the development is within their grade one listed building? Primarily, yes, impacts on, 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 on the historic buildings and the landscape. So you're not concerned that your last five applications have been within that curtilage as well? I think my point on that is every case is determined on its merits. I, I wouldn't like to comment on history of the, of the hotel development because we're looking at this application. Thank you. Any more questions? No. Thank you very much. Moving on. We do not have a supporter, no? No, but we do have the agent, Mr. Philip Branson, and the owner, Mr. McConnell. Um, between you, you have three minutes to address the committee. Good morning, Alan Connell. We purchased Hindusham Golf Club 16 years ago when it had less than 200 members and few public facilities. Since then, substantial improvements have been made, resulting today in a viable, inclusive and thriving facility which is available to all, especially the local community who benefit from free social membership. There are now over 600 golf members and 300 social members. We are more than just a golf club and cater for all types of leisure occasion and we are an integral part of Hintlesham itself. A range of facilities match any golf club in Suffolk, many of whom are privately owned member clubs who impose restrictions on access by the general public, which is not the case at Hintersham Golf Club. Whilst profitable, due to economic conditions, Hintersham Golf Club has not been able to generate sufficient cash over the last five years to maintain the required level of capital expenditure. Despite spending nearly a million pounds on capital expenditure over the last 15 years by reinvesting profits and borrowing, we currently have a backlog in important expenditure. The most significant being the rebuilding of our greenkeepers workshop and storage building, which is falling down. We can cope with future capital expenditure, but need a lump sum to clear the backlog, hence the reason for this enabling application. We, we held pre-application discussions and have followed the advice given. We are, however, shocked at the lack of understanding and empathy shown to us during this process and the comments in the report to the committee, like I underlined, privately owned Hindlesham Golf Club and the benefits will accrue to the private rather than the public. 95% of all golf clubs in England are privately owned. Ipswich Golf Club, Oldborough, Woodbridge, Stowe Market, Stoke by Nayland and, of course, Felix Stowe Ferry are all privately owned. Felixstowe, a member-owned golf club, is held as a paragon of virtue for providing a putting green and a cafe as part of their planning, yet Hintersham already provide these facilities to the public and will continue to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a worthy application. It will not harm the heritage assets in any way. The development is out of sight and hearing of the hall, which is well over 200 metres away. It is only 600 metres away from the village, as mentioned in the report. In other words, just a seven-minute walk or a third of a mile. Is that excessive? I think not. We need to embrace the future, not live in the past dreaming about the mythical Hintlesham Park, which has not existed for three quarters of a century. Indeed, for the last 35 years, it is, a manicured, it is the manicured golf course which has provided the beautiful backdrop, parkland backdrop the hall now enjoys. This is a sustainable development and it will provide more employment and I ask you to support it and the ongoing viability of a valid asset within Bayburg. And just to confirm, there are no re re um, right to revoke our right of way over the driveway. We own part of it in any case and um, our lease on the small piece for the land of trees is on the same terms as our main lease, which is 99 years from 1989, i.e. 66 years remaining. Thank you. Are there any questions, Mr. Cobb? Councillor McGraw. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to ask, and I think it was already raised, about to get some clarity in the <coughs> management and operation of the tree nursery and how you ensure that that could be continued for the future um, under the application. We were just asked to, to provide the land which we were pleased to do so, we have every right to use the land, which I said is the same length of lease as our, our original lease, um, it's part of it. Um, we were not asked any other questions by uh, 
Councillor Busby, we were asked if we could offer the land. But where we can, we would certainly help. We have a green staff. We could, we could look after certain things on a day-to-day -day basis, but we couldn't take responsibility for the trees, but we would help in any way we can. So my, my concern is, is literally that for this to be the positive benefit it's being described as, that there should be some demonstration as to how that benefit could be achieved. Um, at the moment, it, it's a promise, and I'm just asking how we secure that and, and how you would see that view. Uh, my understanding was it was something that the, the, the Baber were, were, were looking to do and they, they, they had arrangements to manage it, not us. But we're happy, as I say, we're happy to provide the land, which is not a, a, a free offer, sorry, it's a free offer to, to Bayberg. It's not free from us because we wouldn't be able to use it for, for the things that we're looking, using it at the moment. Well, in that case, I'd just like to ask if officers can uh, give any indication as to how that might be achieved um, under this application. Um, would you consider instead of having because you've got two bungalows and then one half properties is that because um, we do like bungalows in this would it, is it something you would consider doing to have them all bungalows rather than having one and a half yeah if uh, um, Mr Branton could answer that here's our planning as, as Rose has already said in the report, the application is a hybrid application. Um, the Greenkeeper's building being detailed, so we've provided the full details of that. The, the residential element is only outlined. So at the moment, what you've seen is only indicative. If a condition was put on the applicant, on the consent, that required all the buildings to be single storey, that would be something that we'd obviously have to consider. Um, there is a balance because it's a viability exercise, so there's a balance that we need to raise an element of money to, 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 to invest in, in the Green Cape Keepers buildings and the other elements of the, of, of the improvements to the club. Um, but if, if, um, if that was something that the committee felt strongly about, that single story was, the, was, was, was really what you'd like to see there and happen, and that reduces any chance of any heritage harm, then we'd be happy to consider it. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Hinton. Just a quick point of clarification, really. Um, Rose mentioned some tented holiday accommodation scattered about in, a, in one of the woods. Uh, are those under the control of the golf course or are they part of the Hittlesham Hall? I they're not, they're not, they're nothing to do with us. Our, our, our landlord, i.e. the person who owns the freehold of our lease, yeah. um, his family, I believe, um, run that and own it. Uh, we, we have just provided them with a right of way along our, 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 our track. So it's completely to, separate from the It's completely separate and we're not in control yep. of that. Any more? If not, thank you very much. Uh, um, and we'll come back to Councillor McGraw's question. Would you like to repeat it? Because yes, I'm I was just wondering what mechanisms, if we were inclined to uh, set a condition on the uh, tree nursery, uh, what, what, what arrangements could be made to ensure that uh, it actually happens. If it's going to be described as a benefit, it needs to be, in my view, uh, to be achievable and, and to be manageable um, in, in the long term. Tree nurseries um, can't just be done for six months or a year or two. They take time for the trees to grow. Um, Chairman, if I start, um, Rose, if you could get up the slide which shows the area in question just so we know what we're talking about. Um, I was going to suggest that if um, you needed our help in maintenance of the thing, we, we, we wouldn't be against that if it helped in any way. I, I think at this stage we, we have to establish Fine, okay. what, what the benefit will be to the public as considered by the, the planning officer on, in terms of the planning officer. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, Rose, you've got a tree nursery zone shown on that plan. Do we have any other uh, drawings to show the extent of that area? No, just this is this drawing for the tree nursery zone. Thank you, Rose. 
So, as I understand it, Councillor McGraw, the offer is of a dedicated area for Baber to plant and grow on trees um, as part of our objective to uh, plant 10,000 trees. I don't have any more detail around that. Um, the question of whether that is a public benefit, it certainly appears to be a benefit to the council, whether that's a public benefit is an interesting point. The land is outside the application site and is subject to a lease, so clearly there is going to have to be some element of understanding of a commercial relationship about this. Um, I'm afraid I have more questions than I have answers about what may or may not. It, there is a benefit, whether it is public, I think is far from certain to me. Thank you, Phil. Any more questions? No? Move on then. Thank you very much. Um, ward member? No, no, no more public speakers? No, no more public speakers. Um, Councillor Busby has not submitted a report to the committee, but I believe you've all been in receipt of some words from him over the last day or two. Yes? Okay. And that's, we'll leave it at that at this stage. Okay, I will now open it up for the debate. Would somebody like to kick things off? Councillor Jameson. Thank you, Chair. Um, a lot has been made about the public benefits to this development, but to me, the, there are a few public benefits, but the, but the main uh, benefit, beneficiaries of this are the golf course and the golfers. The development is outside the, the village in its um, the village doesn't need there is no local need as far as I'm aware of, of these houses and I'm struggling to see how we can go against plus as has as, as been made clear by heritage in historic England they're, they're, they've got no um, recommendation for approving this so at this stage I can't really see or I can't see going against Myself going against the the um, officer's recommendation. Councillor McCraw, you you were waving first, then Councillor Barron. Yeah, um, I have to say I'm really glad that we had the opportunity for a site visit um, because it was invaluable to see the lie of the land, and particularly the lines of sight um, running from the the development site and the heritage assets um, and the distance between them, the amount of screening that existed and as, been, as has been pointed out, the number of existing planning permissions that seem to me to be uh, potentially of a greater impact on the heritage assets. Um, uh, I, I understand the decisions made um, for viability for the uh, Hintlesham Hall uh, itself. I don't see why some viability matters shouldn't be applied to Hindlesham Hall Golf Club, which are of course two separate businesses, and, and clearly not entirely on the same page on this one. But that's not our problem. Our problem is looking at the planning balance. And I think the interesting point is, and having seen the site, again, this is crucial, because the planning balance was very much, you know, where we are engaged. The amount of harm, as described on the scale, um, as being a moderate level of less than substantial harm, came bang in the middle of that 180 degree graph, putting it right up the, up the center, whereby this is where a planning committee comes in. We go one way or the other way, based upon our judgment as to what the overall benefits to the public uh, and, and, to, and, to, and to, as opposed to planning principles across the board. We have a duty of looking out for um, prosperity as well as, as, as design and, and impact. Now, the point on impact was, and I was particularly noting this, was that the site where the houses uh, are going to be contained is entirely screened by trees. In fact, it's, um, it's more um, screened than anywhere else in the surrounding area. Um, as long as those trees are retained, which I would suggest we ensure, should we be minded to grant any permission, I would suggest we have those trees retained, then you have a wall, then you have the uh, owner's property, the yellow house, then you have the existing one, two or three planning permissions before you even get close 
to the central building, Hintlesham Hall, the grade one listed. So then it comes down to, so if that balance is engaged, and I think it is engaged about the benefits, I think it is important as to what those benefits are. Um, I don't accept that keeping that golf club is nothing because, I mean, it is providing facility. 900 people are being served, 300 social members, I think 600 actual members. That sounds to me quite a decent number uh, in a community the size of Hintlesham. I, as far as I can see, existing um, heritage harm, not, in, not excluding the pylons, is already far more than severe. I'm actually moving, and having seen the site, I think was crucial, I'm actually moving my part of the, the planning balance moves in favour of granting permission. Uh, it's very well to suggest that the greenkeepers could be given permission, but not the houses. One won't take place without the other. The greenkeepers can't, can't take place unless it has the enabling permission for the housing. We could make conditions on the housing, perhaps by reducing the height uh, for some or all of them. Um, but I'm not entirely convinced by the heritage argument here and that that's that matter of less than substantial harm being in the centre. I would say as long as we can secure all those benefits, I want to see something more on the nurseries. But I do think we actually have a, have a, a literally right in the middle balance question here. Thank you, Councillor McGraw. I, I think the Chief Planning Officer comments. If I may, Chairman, and... Any description of heritage harm, you end up tying yourself in knots with, in my experience. Your starter for 10 should be, and this is required in the NPPF, before you consider all of these other questions, is to give great weight to the conservation of the asset. So you may have a series of planning provisions that exist, but you are deciding this application today on the circumstances you have before you. And the more important the asset, the greater the weight you attached to that conservation. And what we have here is a part grade one, part grade two star asset, the hall. So the, starter, the, the starting principle, putting it in, in layman's terms, is to give great weight to protecting those things. Then you come to this question of weighing the less than substantial harm test, and lawyers have played with that over plenty of time, and you are in a point where you, you have to have public benefits engaged, and I would suggest to you those need to be quite serious public benefits for that to engage, even with the, the balance that Rose described. And opinions will differ about what that actually means. But the heritage test starts with conserving the asset. You've talked again about scale and other matters. As a piece of advice to any committee looking at an outline application in the setting of a heritage asset, I would be most, most careful. You have no certainty about reserve matters. But once you say yes to the scale of something, it's gone. You cannot revisit that. Is that reasonable? I question that. So I understand what you're describing about balance, but please, I would remind committee, you start from the first principle that is great weight attaches to conserving the asset, and here you have assets which are at the higher end of importance nationally. Thank you, Chairman. As I call, you to Can I ask the Chief Planning Officer then just to clarify that um, you mentioned we, we are should be careful to secure um, at outline because once it's gone, it's gone. Can we secure any conditions on the scale of those buildings? For example, as bungalows has been mentioned, is that within our gift? And, and would that uh, answer part of that question in terms of impact on the heritage asset? So my advice to you, Chair, Chair, Chairman, well, my advice to committee is that you shouldn't really be looking at an outline application which does not give you the certainty to assess all of the potential elements of it, detailed design, scale, layout, all of the elements that would be reserved matters. I think, if I'm, if I'm uh, putting this simply, I would be expected to see this as a full element of an application if you were expected to make a decision in its favour today. Outline creates too much uncertainty for a committee to reach a conclusion over, in my opinion. On that point then, Chair, is it possible to defer it until the full application can be brought forward so that we don't have any hybrid um, element? Is that possible? I'm, no, I'm only asking the question. I mean, are we obliged to decide? It is always possible, but let's hear some more. That's fine. Debate. Okay, I just wanted to ask the possibility. 
Councillor Harren, you were wishing to speak. Chairman, yes, thank you. Um, despite what's been said by the officer, I think we're charged here today to make the very best decision we can, bearing all these other things in mind. Um, as somebody who works sort of on sites and within the industry, I, um, I find heritage a hard one, trying to preserve something that's quite largely already gone. Um, I might not quite be in favour of that. And I think we do have to take into mind what's already happening and happened with Hindlesham Hall itself. Um, so I'm, it's a hard one. It's a rock and a hard place, Chairman. Um, also, there's the benefit to the business. Um, they say that um, they're not going to attract maybe any more new business throughout of this, but then we have a responsibility, I think, um, for preserving what's there already in, as the business. Um, we may not enhance it for the future this time around, but um, if we don't do the right thing today, there may not be a business or jobs at all. Obviously, leisure industry has been through a hard time. I'll be interested to hear what people say, but at the moment, I would, providing the five dwellings didn't, and we can condition that, I'd probably be well in favour of, um, of granting this application. You know, I hear everything that's said, and I've heard it so many times before when I've sat on this committee, but um, I think sometimes you've just got to do the right thing at the right time. So at the moment, if somebody's prepared to propose it, I would certainly be prepared to um, second it. We will have um, visit reserve matters later. So we would get another bite of the cherry then. But at the moment, I'm leaning very well in favour of um, passing this application, Chairman. And I, I, I will, will come back later, I would say. Thank you, Councillor Horan. I will make a comment myself. We, none of us are picking up on the point from Councillor Jameson about there being no need for these houses and the objection from the village itself to the urbanisation of this particular area. And I very much would like to hear what other people's comments on that is, as well as, as the heritage. Councillor Barrett, you are next. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, what I find I have a problem with this is the inconsistency of the, uh, the planning process in terms that you've got buildings, um, substantial buildings being built closer to the grade one listed asset. Um, and this is further away, probably, I mean, this is where I find the inconsistency of the planning process is very annoying. Um, and then we're told we can't do it. But I think at the end of the day, the planning committee, I think we mustn't be you know, we are the man on the Clapham Omnibus. We are there to look at this with a fresh set of eyes and a reasonable approach to it. Um, we're not just rule-based. I know planning is rule-based, but I think within those rules there is certain areas which make it very easy for us to go down. Uh, and bear in mind, this is an outline permission. All we are giving is a principle of development, nothing more. Access and principle, that's what outline is. And they're, they're demonstrated there. So what, you've got to, what we've got to do is just look whether we Thanks feel... Barrett, it's not totally outlined. It's, it's a hybrid application. It's only outlined on the houses. I think I needed to point that out to you. I know. And I'm talking about the houses. I'm not talking about because the recommended, there's a recommended... This is what is even more bizarre. So we have a recommendation for approval of a, a workshop which is you know, next door to an application which apparently is not acceptable uh, within the whole heritage thing. I mean, the, I find it really difficult to how you justify putting approval on one and uh, n refusal on, on, on an outline. But looking at the outline application, all we're looking at is the principle of development and the access to that development, which is clearly there. Um, and I, and I think um, the elements of those previous applications, which were outside the built-up area boundary, but have managed to be approved, negates the argument that was put forward about this being outside the built-up area boundary. Where's the consistency in the approach? I'll ask the area planning manager to comment. 
Yeah, yes, Chair, I just want to pick up on the, the analysis of Historic England's comments. I think it's worth just looking at them again, if, if members could, because they're quite reasoned. Um, I do understand comments about other things that have been allowed. Quite often those were for the betterment of the listed building itself, so that that was the balancing act then. But, but Historic England has stated that it doesn't oppose the Greenkeeper's Lodge being relocated because the, the line of sight um, element is not so critical. It would be behind where it is now, and therefore the heritage arm for it would be less than it is now. So that's why they're comfortable with that. Uh, the, the issue with the, with the housing, um, well, I'll, I'll read this paragraph. There is some erosion in character of the non-designated parkland surrounding the buildings, but the legibility of association between the hall, stables, wall, garden, parkland behind is still apparent. The houses would erode this and alter the hierarchy of uses on the site, and therefore that's the harm. So that, that's their reasoning there. Um, it's worth maybe looking at what was said and looking at, at the detail behind it rather than making general statements about heritage matters, I think. Thank you. James, and you wish to, you wish to speak. Uh, uh, just um, with regard to the previous developments that have been brought up now, if I understand it correctly, and whatever the rights or wrongs of approving those developments, they were for to, to build areas that would generate ongoing investment into the whole on a continual ongoing basis. Um, this development, this, these houses, as far as I can see, are going to be a one, a one almost a one-off lump sum um, to cover shortfalls they've already got. When that money's spent, and if they run short again, are they going to come back with a further area of land they're selling off to, for more development? That's... Councillor Owen, then Councillor Hinton. Thank you. I think if we're mind to accept this, we've got a there's got to be a lot of conditions on it. I, I don't think we could just let it let it go. Um, it's like you, they, it hasn't had a flood risk assessment done on it, and obviously the need. Um, I am I am thinking because of Hintlesham Hall's done a lot of planning applications and they've been granted. I know we shouldn't be looking at that and these are further away. I am thinking more of going with this, but only because I can't see so much harm, but there needs to be conditions if we do go to it. I don't think we could just let it just go. I think, I think the conditions, it's got to be very strong conditions to this, that nothing else can be built on the land. Um, yeah, that's... Um, that's it, really. That's all I can say. Councillor Hinton. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, the recommendation is it was a complicated application, <coughs> excuse me, simply because it's a hybrid. Um, part of it's for full applications, part of it's outline. Uh, part of it has tacit approval, part of it doesn't. So it's, it was always going, to be <clears throat> always going to be a complicated situation. Uh, what puzzles me to a certain extent about it is that um, on page 22 of the report, it talks about the Ipswich Group Patch 2, whoever they might be, uh, didn't respond, and the British Horse Society didn't respond. So I thought we're not building stables here, we're talking about a greenkeeper's shed. Uh, so why on earth did they have to be involved? Are they a statutory uh, uh, person? Historic England, I can understand, and their comments are, are quite extensive. But I'll set those to one side for a moment uh, on the basis that the recommendation for refusal includes policies CS2, CS15 of the core strategy, policies CN01, CN06, C014 local plan, as well as paragraphs, and goes on and on and on. Loads of policies that this is against. One of the basic policies for development in our rural communities is CS11, which isn't actually mentioned here. Um, but one of the things that is linked to that, of course, is a, establishing a need, a housing need. Well, if you look at the annual monitoring report, which I'm sure you've all got copies to hand on, you've all been studying it 
ab uh, ad adamantly. Uh, Hintlesham built eight houses last year. We're talking about another five here. How many houses does Hintlesham have to build to satisfy a need? I'm not surprised no survey was done. I don't suppose there was a need within the village. Um, so it's contrary to that. It's outside the built-up area boundary. These are houses for individuals to, to live in rather than uh, part of uh, anything else. So I think that uh, we should look at our policies rather more than we should be looking at uh, almost a certain amount of emotion as to whether or not something's gone before and should we be taking that into consideration. Thank you, Councillor Clinton. Plan, area planning manager. Thanks, Jack. A couple of points to clarify. Uh, uh, Councillor Owens mentioned about the flood risk assessment. There, there is a section in there which, which explains what happened there. Um, ultimately, the, the locally floods authority agreed no assessment was required because the actual developable part of the site is under the threshold. It included the track, which took it over the threshold, but it's really under, so they're, they're happy with that. There's an outstanding issue we've got to talk to the internal, <coughs> internal drainage board about, but that's, I think we can park that for the minute. Um, the Council Hinton CS11, it, it was mentioned in the report, but it was felt that it's so far from the, hint, the hinterland village that it wasn't the right policy to judge it by. Instead, we look at CS250. Councillor Owens. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I just, I, I, I concur with uh, Councillor McGraw. I think the site inspection visit was, uh, and perhaps that's the benefit of site inspection visits, I was very glad to do that, because you got the actual um, perception of how this development would look. I, I concur with all that's been said about um, the heritage, but our world has changed in the last two years, whether we like it or not, and um, this is a business that wants to survive, uh, I understand Councillor Jameson's comment that um, perhaps it, um, the impact of the sale of the houses will be short-lived, but I think um, its neighbour has done a lot to um, enhance its own business, and so I think uh, this business should be given a chance to enhance their business. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Ayres. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of things. Um, I would have liked on the site visit for us to be able to observe the um, extensions that have been added to Hindrisham Hall. We didn't see those to have any idea of how they looked. I don't know if that was relevant or not, but because it's been brought up, it would have been nice to have seen them. And the second was on page 23, um, on paragraph 5, it's... Um, it's clear that as a non-designated heritage asset change has occurred to the uses of the parkland, which has been harmful to the setting of the listed building, but this should not be used as a justification for the possibility of more harm or cumulative harm. So we're back to that bit in the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? Chairman, if I can just come in. Um, the uh, issue before you is, as I think we discussed in relation to the nursery, somewhat unclear. The applicant, as I understand it, talking about various elements that will be funded out of this development. Uh, we have not uh, audited those figures, nor have we any detailed understanding of whether or not they are proportionate to what's proposed. Um, I think in the circumstances of that, there is an absence of information to enable you to be confident that this is no more and no less than what is required to service what is being asked of it. So to that extent, uh, I would express some concern about members if they chose to uh, conclude that permission should be granted on the information today. Now, uh, there's also elements of the proposal here which are outside the application site. Uh, drainage irrigation across the course is described. There's a number of elements to this which are, I think, ill described in the application and left for you to draw your own conclusions over. We talked about the nursery earlier and I, uh, I think we don't have certainty as officers in what the position is with those. 
Um, in the circumstances, I think it would be challenging to reach a conclusion that Planning Commission could and should be granted on the facts as they stand to get today. I do think that if members are minded to take that view, as is their discretion, the reasonable approach will be to seek further information around those elements if that's where they chose to go. And I don't recommend that. I think that you have uh, a clear recommendation and you have two technical advisors advising of harm. We've talked a lot about the height of buildings and its impact on uh, the experience of heritage asset. That isn't the only test in relation to heritage assets. It is a wider question. Um, and well, I imagine the hall will be extremely interested in as they're sufficiently interested to send somebody here today to observe proceedings and contribute. So I think you've got quite a lot of challenging contexts. If members are inclined to support this as a development, there are lots of elements to it, one of which we have touched on in relation to the outline aspect. Others relate to what may or may not prove to be public benefits. Um, and I think uh, if I was asked, I would say that at the moment you have uh, a paucity of information to enable you to reach a conclusion on them in a reasonable way. So if you're inclined to go in that direction, Chairman, and I know there has been debate about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't think that should necessarily happen in the context of a substantive resolution, but in the context of a deferral that committee are minded to take a course of action. And you know, I say that understanding that there are significant harms here which should not be taken lightly. So I hope that's useful, Chairman. Councillor McCraw. Well, we're coming down to the nub of it now, I suspect. Um, as I understand it, the Chief Planning Officer is suggesting that if we were minded to grant, we should consider deferring uh, for more information, and I think it would be useful, I'll be honest, with, and I was, in, I was hinting at that before in finding out how, whether our, our public realm, for example, would undertake the management and um, setting up of a, a, a young tree plantation, how we would fix that in, um, but I also get the impression that we're being told not to do that, that we should refuse immediately, and that would finalise the whole thing. And I'm not inclined, I have to say at the moment, to say, no, that's it, no. I, I don't think that that's justified, even though we do have a lack of information, well, perhaps we should have done more to seek it out, I don't know. But I'd have liked to have some a bit more information. So I'm, I'm lost here. I'm prepared to suggest deferment um, for more information, but I'd like to hear what other members feel on that before we come to any conclusion as to a proposal. I, I, I think you're in the situation where I'm going to put my two penny worth in, and we said this moment in time, that, that if we find this is not a satisfactory application and the information is short, then we refuse it and ask for a resubmission at some particular time. I think deferment may well just delay what's going to happen event, eventually anyway. Anyway, that's my two pounds worth. So, Councillor Owen, you're, you're, you're... I was going to say our second deferral, but if that's the way... There's no proposal yet. Councillor Hinton, go on. Uh, I'd like to agree with you, uh, Mr Chairman. If we refuse this application, the applicant has a chance to come back with either two separate applications or more details on the houses or whatever. The information that we seek could be supplied in that coming back. If we defer, it just sort of muddies up the water a bit and doesn't actually give anybody any basis to do anything. Councillor Osborne, I think we'll hear you over the conversation going on behind you. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. I, I tend to agree with you and Councillor Hinton. Deferral will be uh, getting away from the, the point that we need to make a decision. And um, 3.17 of, of, of the the report, I think, does speak uh, volumes about uh, where we should be. But obviously, uh, I do not agree with a deferral. Thank you. Any more comment? Councillor Hinton. If nobody else is commenting, Mr Chairman, can I propose the officer's recommendation? Thank you. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Jameson. Thank you. Is there any more comments to make before we move to a vote? Thank you. Just before you go to that, can I have you to... 
There's no problems with that in terms of the wording that you said in the officer's recommendation. We, we just go ahead. Uh, uh, no, Chair, unless you want to s put some finesse right at the end saying that there's intervention. Uh, you, you seem to be suggesting that you might want the applicant to come back with a, with a better scheme and it might be OK. I, if that is your view, then... I, I don't... I, I yeah, don't. In that case, let's stay with the yeah, recommendation. OK, so we have a proposal and a seconder, and we're going to go to the vote. Thank you, Chair. So, members, uh, the vote is. Give you a moment. Now, there, you are voting for refusal or not. Councillor Hurry. I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Thank you, members. Chair, we have five votes for refusal and five votes against. Therefore, comes down to the chairman. We have your casting vote. My casting vote is to go with refusal. With refusal. Thank you, Chair. So that is carried as a refusal. Thank you, everyone. Right, we have one more. Can we take a five minute break, please? Yes. To allow people.
Thank you. Welcome back, all. Um, we will move on to the next item, which is DC 2106805, land east of the Constable Country Medical Centre, Heath Road, East Bergholt. And the presenting officer is Sam. Samantha? Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, members. Uh, the application comes to committee for transparency because of the controversial nature of this particular site. Uh, this is also a major application because the scheme is for more than four, <coughs> uh, 15 dwellings. Uh, the application is for land east of the Constable Country Medical Centre on Heath Road in East Bergholt. The application site is shown in the hatched area um, and received uh, outline planning permission for a mixed use development of up to 75 dwellings, a preschool and a neighbourhood hub comprising a swimming pool, office space and a local shop. Public open space and associated infrastructure were also included in the outline permission uh, of B160092. The reserve matters uh, were received in 2020 and granted by the planning committee uh, last year. Uh, this included access, layout, scale, appearance and landscaping. The application before members today is a section 73 application to vary two of those conditions of the reserve matters application. The application seeks to amend the operation and delivery times of the shop and also the construction hours of the development. The application site is located on the edge of the village on Heath Road. If I just go back a slide. We have uh, the high school up here in this area. Um, uh, there are open fields uh, to the east and south of the site. Um, and we have the medical center located just here and then the dwellings of Richardson's Road share the boundary just along here. The site location plan shows a bit more clearly the relationship of the existing development to the application site. There are dwellings um, on Richardson's Road um, and the medical centre just along this boundary to the west here. This plan shows the constraints of the site. Uh, the site is outside of the built-up area boundary, which is shown by uh, the brown line that you just might be able to see just along here. Uh, there are public footpaths to the north, just here and here. Uh, they showed with the green dotted line. And there's also a footpath to the south, just here, which is known as the donkey track. Uh, these green areas are the areas of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, this is the site layout uh, the members agreed for the reserve matters application. Uh, there is a landscaping belt around most of the boundaries. There's an attenuation pond just here. The dwellings are located in this area here. Um, and then the neighborhood hub is up in this northwestern corner of the site just here near the medical center um, and we have the preschool here swimming pool here and then the shop just here looking at the neighborhood hub in a little more detail uh, you can just see those buildings again with the preschool here um, swimming pool and then the shop just here there's also a delivery bay for the shop located in this area here. Uh, the scheme includes 26 affordable uh, units. Eight of these are actually flats above the shop. Uh, so therefore the prime consideration of this particular application is residential amenity and how extra opening times of the shop and the deliveries may impact particularly these uh, flats above the shop, but also some of the surrounding dwellings around the site as well. 
The application seeks to vary the wording of two conditions uh, where specific times have been restricted. Condition 7 concerns the operation times of the shop, which were restricted to between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., with no deliveries outside of those areas. Uh, members may remember that at the Reserved Matters uh, Committee meeting, uh, it was discussed that perhaps uh, we should be a bit more lenient about the timings uh, for the shop. At that stage, everything had already been considered and we would have needed to go out to reconsultation. So that's the reason that this application has been received um, after the reserve matters, just to clarify the opening times and to change them slightly. Uh, condition eight of the reserve matters uh, concerned the construction hours, uh, which were restricted to 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Mondays to Friday, and 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturdays, with no working on Sundays or bank holidays. Dealing with condition seven for the shop, uh, firstly, the applicant wanted to change the opening hours to 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. with deliveries outside of those hours. The parish council, environmental health, and the strategic housing team all objected to those hours on the basis that before 7 a.m. in the morning is considered to be nighttime, and therefore noise before this time is antisocial particularly delivery vehicles with engines running and some with refrigerated units on board, making noise in a very residential area. The Parish Council helpfully provided the opening hours of the co-op and post office store in the centre of the village, which are 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. The applicant was sent, uh, has sent written confirmation that he is agreeable to these revised hours. Um, with also the deliveries being made within that time frame and not outside, which would be considered to be nighttime hours. At the time of writing the committee report, the revised hours were still at consultation with, uh, with the Parish Council, Environmental Health and Strategic Housing. Um, we have received all of those responses now and they are in your tabled papers for you to be able to see what has been said. All of the objections have actually been removed and they are content with those opening hours of 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Dealing with condition eight, uh, the construction hours, the condition restricts working hours on the construction site to be between 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday and 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturdays with no working on Sundays or bank holidays. The applicant has applied for a change to the weekday hours by increasing the working hours by one hour in the morning, with working hours beginning at 7 a.m. and finishing at 6 p.m. Environmental health raised concerns over the additional hour, saying that there wasn't justification for that extra hour. However, the parish council did not object uh, to, to, the, to the extra hour in the morning. Um, and officers considered that the additional hour would not be harmful to residential amenity because the site is not in a built-up area. Um, it's a very large site, and it's likely that in that first hour, the workers will be setting up and getting their things together before they start any noisy processes. It is for a limited time only, just during construction. The application is recommended for approval with all conditions from the Reserve Matters Permission being carried over to this Section 73 application. Uh, legal advice is being sought at the moment on whether a supplementary deed is required, uh, which would ensure that the seven, th this se Section 73 is bound to the original Section 106 agreement um, and that nothing is missed out on there. Um, if a new deed is required, uh, the decision will be held back until that has all been signed and sealed. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Any questions for the officer? Councillor Ayres. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Very detailed. I was just looking at page 54, 3.9, um, and in the um, second sentence it said there should be no deliveries to the development arranged for outside of these hours unless otherwise agreed in writing. And I, I seem quite nebulous. 
I just wondered could you come back with that. Thank you. Yeah, so that does enable us to be able to do that through a written uh, agreement rather than having to keep having applications coming backwards and forwards. Um, however, because this particular, um, the issues around residential amenity, we felt that it was best to actually submit an application because it did need to go out for a reconsultation because of the flats above. It's just that I thought if in writing um, they could maybe do it every week or whatever, you know, would there be no sort of limit on it? They could do that. However, they would need our written permission that they could uh, change the hours at all. So we still remain in control of that. I think it's unlikely because they've actually put a proper application in and come back with these hours. But they are still able to do that if they wish. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Yab, that, um, that's, that practice has been sort of uh, discredited, leaving those words in. I checked it. I didn't take those wording out. We should just take that out. It doesn't really say anything. If they want to change the condition, they have to apply to change the condition again. So we'll, we'll take out that wording about unless otherwise agreed. Sorry, Sam, I had a spot done. Hi. Um, the Fire and Rescue asked for Condition 16. Is that something that's going to happen or is it? Thank you. Yeah, so all of the conditions from the Reserve Matters application, they will all be carried forward. So if there was a requirement for fire hydrants on the Reserve Matters application, that will still be carried forward to this one. Any more questions? No? Thank you very much, Sam. Do we have any public speakers? No public speakers at all. I presume the ward member, you're staying on the committee, but you're going to open up the debate for us. Yes, please, Mr. Chairman. Um, not an awful lot to, to discuss here. Uh, personally, I think that the, the hours of opening are going to be a little bit onerous for the residents above it, but uh, it's very difficult to justify anything more restrictive than the ones that already exist on the co-op in the middle of the village. Um, so it's a, a pragmatic decision there. I think the construction times bringing it forward from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. is useful to a certain extent as it will take quite a lot of the tradesmen's vehicles out of the traffic flows when the children are going to the high school, which of course is just opposite that site, so it will have a, a safety impact uh, improvement in, uh, in that respect. So uh, I have no uh, real concerns about this. these two changes of conditions. There are other conditions which Sam knows about that I'm... Uh, in discussions with her on, um, but as far as these two are concerned, then uh, I have no problems with them and I recommend approval. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do you wish to say anything more? No, you're just happy to second it. Does anybody want to make a council McCall? Did you want to? No? Now you're going to second. Anyone else with any comments to make? If not, we make absolutely sure what we're just voting. before you vote chair just, just to confirm that we'll remove the words which the councillor referred to unless otherwise agreed in writing those will be removed from condition seven yeah, and otherwise it says so, so yep take it to a vote Claire, if you will thank you chair members that vote is in progress councillor barrett four thank you councillor Hyde. Councillor Ayres, would you like me to take yours further, please? Yes. Thank you. Chair, that's ten votes for. That's unanimous. Ten votes for. Thank you. That's that passed. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. The next meeting is scheduled for the 13th of April, 2022, here in the chamber. I now formally close the meeting. Thank you.